Okay, let's get started. I see there's quite a few people that are already in there. And of course, we're welcome. I am the lead from DexyDAO. And uh, this is our DAO Talk um, live space uh, on Twitter, aka X. Um, as it happens, we're on Tuesdays. So here we are again on another Tuesday. Our guest today is near and dear to me um, as a creator myself. And I'll let her introduce herself. But as a songwriter and as a comedian, um, it's interesting to talk about all kinds of down topics uh, for all kinds of stakeholders. But uh, I'm personally always especially interested in uh, in artists and creatives and what it means for them and how they can um, better their situation via blockchain technology, via DAOs in terms of engaging their community and uh, promoting their work and just really um, creating value and I would say retaining value that they create uh, for themselves and their community and just uh, creating a more holistic experience. I don't want to use too many buzzwords, but but it's kind of hard to avoid them, right? In any case, um, I am really excited to welcome Sarah and uh, Sarah to introduce herself and then we'll go through some questions and just talk. Oh, thank you. Thank you. What a what an honor to be on your stage. Um, this is a as, as a topic that's really, like you said, dear <laughs> to your heart in general, I think the maker community in general has such a, a visceral reaction to emerging tech sometimes, specifically when we talk about blockchain technology and um, what a non-fungible token is and what DAOs are in general. I think that there's an apprehension. And so having the opportunity to sit and chit-chat about how these emerging techs can actually benefit the creative in profound ways, especially ways that we've never seen before in the whole course of history. So um, to be given this opportunity is very special to me. So thank you. And thank you to each and every person that is here today. Um, you have many different places that you could be in many different spaces. And the fact that you're here is a tremendous privilege and it's an honor. Your presence is is um, very, very special. So thank you for being here. Well, apparently Facebook is down, so that could, it could be a part of the reason, but I'm hoping that that not the exclusive reason people are here. Uh, I'm hoping you all are excited to hear about uh, how DAOs and creatives impact each other. And uh, on that note, uh, you already mentioned that there's a visceral reaction, right, for makers uh, when you hear about blockchain and they related to it. I would like to talk before we get into the sort of solutions and what we can do, just kind of paint a picture uh, for those who may not be aware as much as you are, um, and certainly for myself as well, of uh, more of what happens to the creatives, to the makers, what kind of feelings they experience, what kind of apprehensions they experience uh, when they hear about NFTs, blockchain, DAOs, crypto, all of those things. Uh, what kind of things have you seen come up? kind of reactions, what kind of emotions? Well, I've been a part of the maker community for well over two decades, right? And my job in the arts and crafts industry is actually to park it and sit myself right there at the crossroads of traditional art and craft and emerging tech. Um, we had the same kind of reaction, actually, believe it or not, with 3D printers <laughs> way back in the day. Um, and it was really interesting to think about how I actually happened upon um, the Web3 digital overlay in general. I was assigned a task to write some articles. And at the time, everything was completely negative. It was very biased. And I think from a media point of view, a lot of folks take the easy route. And I decided to embed myself into the community itself and try to understand why there was this pull. What was it in the psychology or the zeitgeist? Um, of the ecosystem at hand, you know, during the COVID years, et cetera, that kind of on roaded and on ramped all of these random people. Um, you know, I've been a part of Twitter <laughs> since its inception, right? But Twitter, our, our crypto Twitter or X, as we now say, is a completely different beast. And so I thought, well, what community should I join? Then um, I was invited into the DAS community of all things because a lot of the designers there. Um, our 3D digital artists, and I had worked with them in my real world experience. So 
I, I, you know, obviously joined a discord and I started listening to the voices of the people, you know, and understanding their why. And I thought to myself, you know, for makers, especially who were so anti NFT, they felt like their work was being copied and stolen, or they, they felt like it was a Ponzi scheme. Um, they didn't understand what digital currency was, but more so and even on more a uh, deeper level, did not understand the power of blockchain. I think many people here in the in the room today may not understand or know of the history behind blockchain. It was actually, you know, MacGyvered in the 1970s, you know, when people were being erased, when histories were being erased, when um, events, current events were being, you know, disappeared. And the the folks that thought behind the scenes, how can we add a digital notary? How can we add, you know, a block, block in this information in such a way that the voices of the voiceless are preserved for posterity and that the truth and the transparency of history in all of its many facets, good, bad, you know, <laughs> neutral, um, could be preserved. And so, you know, when I thought of it in that perspective, I thought, wow, how many craftsmen are we losing in any given 24 hours? Amazing people with incredible skill sets that are being lost to history and we are not preserving them. Um, and so it, it, it kind of, you know, made me think about stuff. And, and it's interesting too, because you had, for me, I was not, you know, I was agnostic, chain agnostic. You know, I understood Bitcoin <clears throat> basically from Maker Faire. Um, I had paid a bunch of um, college kids 20 bucks in 2010 because they were talking about this digital currency and they were so excited about it. And I thought, you know, they're, they're college kids. <laughs> Give them some fear money. <laughs> and they wrote my wallet on the back of a business card. I mean, um, the business card went through the wash. It became drier lint. <laughs> And, you know, such as life, you know, when it happens with these kinds of technologies. But when you think about the Bitcoin uh, movement, when you think about Ethereum or Solana or, or, you know, Polymatic or whatever, you know, you're thinking of all of these different chains. You know, we have emerging chains like Chia, for instance, that are solving some of those old kind of problems that, that you know, invasive kinds of things that happen with the environment and whatnot. You have all of these different chains, right? But the underlying tech is something that makers um, need to take a look at because it's not changing. It's not going to go away. Those kinds of technologies are going to be used, whether it's to, you know, keep your your mortgage or your your assets or your vaccination records or whatever it is. Um, they're all going to be preserved on those chains. Now, the question of, of the day is, do you want somebody else to have that chain or are you going to build your own? Which is now the the thing that folks are thinking about is whether or not they should be building their own blockchain and keeping their own data. Um, and that's where DAOs come in in a lot of ways too, is that when you think about your patrons, when you think about the people who invest in you, um, these could be mentors also. They don't necessarily have to be the collectors of your artwork. Um, my kids, for instance, um, learned at the hemlines of incredible makers and professors and um, just wonderful, wonderful people. Wouldn't it be awesome to be able to give them their flowers too and recognize them in a situation like a, a DAO kind of community where you could reward those folks that have invested in you in other ways and other currencies. And so that's kind of where um, I've been thinking about a lot lately. And I go to lots of spaces and I listen to folks and I listen to their stories and it's very fascinating because you know what humans, we have so many things that divide us, but um, there's, there's certain things that transcend borders and cultures and languages and, and unite us as humans that want for mobility and the need to matter and to be relevant is kind of universal. And um, I think those are the kinds of things that we see you know, in blockchain <laughs> as the underlying pulse that kind of, you know, um, projects it forward. So I don't know if I answered your question or not and kind of babbled a little bit, but it gives you kind of a perspective, you know, in terms of where my journey started, but also um, how, you know, there's a, a big group of people that are 
anxious still. I mean, think about since November and AI and how many digital artists are feeling um, and extreme anxiety <laughs> about where their livelihoods are going to be. Um, these are all kind of fundamental truths that we're all noodling over and trying to figure out where our place is in this new ecosystem in the fourth revolution or fourth turning, as some people call it. So, yeah. Yeah, to be honest, I, I figured out what my question was. It just was interesting to listen to you. Uh, and, and a lot of things definitely resonated, like keeping the record and actually making sure it's not lost to history. And and yeah, I mean, both blockchain and cryptography go, go way back. And there's a lot of, you know, kind of censorship resistance, irrelevance resistance in there, um, which is very powerful. Well, I wasn't going to ask this, wasn't thinking at least about it, but you raised an interesting point about AI copying and others copying. Uh, there's at least one digital artist um, working, creating NFTs who I support, um, but he does not, not to call him out by name, but he does kind of uh, variations on on pop culture themes uh, like Star Wars or, or you know, Disney themed, et cetera. And have been cases of, you know, those kind of big companies um, kind of protecting their IP and then coming after people doing that. And I can see both sides, right? Um, IP matters, of course, right? Every creator wants to protect their IP or at least have the ability to, but also um, iteration on someone else's IP or some other culture to create something new is important and it has to exist. So uh, do you have any opinion or do you, have you seen some sort of discourse that you can speak to on that kind of um, dilemma of protecting IP versus kind of free creation in the streets of the block. You know, as a designer for the art industry, right, um, I can clock with an egg timer how quickly artwork that I've created was copied and stolen. Um, and I know it wounds. <laughs> it does. It wounds the soul of the creative. But, um, you know, my, my perspective has changed a little bit. Um, but let's look at history. You know, we think that Leonardo da Vinci was a genius. He is a genius. Um, how many people in the audience know what a Lucida camera is? L-U-C-I-D-A camera is. And you may um, have heard it from art class, but I don't yeah. know the first thing about it. <laughs> well, what it is, is it's, you know, polished, you know, kind of frames that allow us to trace and allow us to... Um, you know, kind of capture the outline of an image. Um, prolific artists throughout time have used whatever tools they've had on hand to give them the mechanical advantage. And in this case, with AI especially, you think about how quickly something can be copied and pasted and, and, pasted and, and where our humanity lies in something that is, you know, a collaboration with a technology. Um, and it, rather than fighting it, because I think you have to think of yourself in terms of energy, right? Your current, air quote, C, your currency is your energy, is your attention. As an artist, if I was to spend every waking moment thinking about the folks that are stealing my stuff or going after them legally, um, I would be even poorer than I am at this point, right? <laughs> because that, that um, legal warfare um, does add up. And for the little guy, you can't compete. You know, now can Disney protect their IP? Absolutely. But we have all the tools on hand at our fingertips now to protect your IP, whether copyright exists or not. Because deep down, you have to ask yourself your, your internal why. Why does this tick you off <laughs> when someone copies your stuff? It's because you're not getting credit. <laughs> And, and that ego deep down inside you says, well, wait a second, I discovered this and, and I want to have some kind of ownership. This is the fruits of my labor. And it's a very human feeling. It's a very human want to be able to profit um, from the time and energy that you've put into a piece of artwork. And it is a fundamental truth. I mean, when you think about the emerging technologies in general, what is it actually doing? It's changing the narrative. It's changing the nomenclature. It's changing the definition of what it is to be a maker, what it is to be human, and what it is to create in general. What what facets 
And those kinds of fundamental questions are something that you have to ask yourself, right? What somebody else thinks about you lives in their head, <laughs> right? But, and, and you're not supposed to give them quarter in your own, but to think about how you, you're personally, you know, as an artist, as a creator, feel about the things that you've created. Um, I have found personally, and this, you can take it or leave it. <laughs> it, it is a spicy take maybe, but I have found that when I release stuff out into the wild and allow it to be open source, what's fantastic about it is that the people who love and support and, and cherish my artwork, they defend me in a way that I could never do that myself. If someone is taking advantage of the AI or AI, um, IP, um, or using it to train their AI, I know, Freudian slip, um, then it's interesting because they'll come to my defense. And um, we've found that in our industry too. You know, Target, um, let's see, uh, a number of different companies. Um, I'm trying to think of the, the big case, but Target had one where they're, they hired it out. They hired out their, their designers and their designers stole something from Etsy. And it was a small, tiny little shop. And what happened was, is the backlash of people that said, wait a second, a, a regular human, a crafter made this and you are stealing their livelihood <laughs> by copying and stealing. And of course, you know, um, Target ended up paying them handsomely for the idea and, and um, the infringement. But it is one of those things that you think about. We're entering into a phase where your social capital and your social currency, your reputation is going to matter more than you possibly can imagine. If you are living your life in such a way that you are, you know, <laughs> hurting other humans or you are profiting from their labors, um, karma is going to be swift. And it's going to be in such a way that we don't even really know yet. So, um, you know, when I think about copyright, I think about people like, let's say, Claire Silver or Sasha Styles, or, um, you know, these, or, or even Chris, um, for folks that I know Chris's work, these are all cases that have been sent to court. <laughs> they sent, they've been decided in court what it means to have a copyright, what it means to co-collaborate with the technology. And it's given us kind of, you know, guide rails and how we are going to use that information ourselves. But Ultimately, at the end of the day, um, you get to decide. You get to decide whether it's um, whether you're going to build because you can or because you have to. It's yours to give. It's not somebody else's to take. And once it's set free out into the universe, um, you know, the pragmatic approach is just to say, "Look, <laughs> I'm sending it out there, and I hope that I do get you know some kickback from this." But um, in the same breath, it's not saying I'm going to get kicked in the teeth. <laughs> it's also, you know, you look at it and you say, if I'm going to write a book or if I have a, an awesome character or a piece of artwork, I can notarize that on the blockchain. That is a timestamp. That is provenance. That is immutable. That is something that can't be taken away. And whether another person recognizes that or not, history does. And so, you know, I've, I've thought about this in, in great detail, you know, um, from here on out, the work that I present, you know, whether it's to a publisher or to a manufacturer, I already own the domain name. I already own the ENS. I already own, you know, those scripted ideas. And, and since now, you know, our smart contracts have evolved in such a way, you can embed them with audio notes. You can embed them with your screenshots of your work in progress. Um, you can embed them with all sorts of metadata that protects that idea. So, you know, you can put it out in the world and you can have faith that someone's going to riff off of it and that you get to be a part of that process, but you also get to take part in the profits later on because of those, those um, notarized <laughs> provident, uh, providential smart contracts, those kinds of things. But yeah, it still hurts. I'm not going to lie, guys. <laughs> when someone uh, takes your artwork, it still hurts. But yeah. you know what? It is what it is. 
I personally, I love when people take my stuff because at the end with music, there's so much new that can be done in it. And the whole kind of old idea of when people hear a cover, they discover the original, right? New generations and new communities discover the original. But I wouldn't say that to your point that history remembers, I would say community remembers too, right? So if you have a community, your community will know that it's you and your community will let others know it's you. And so kind of, I mean, we already have, the royalty system that rewards the original creators and that I think can be definitely improved to to reward the original IP holders as well. Uh, if there's, you know, original works that use someone else's IP, uh, I'm actually really disturbed by OpenSea uh, kind of backing down on, on their mandatory royalty thing, just trying to compete for market share and completely abandon their original purpose. But anyway, that aside, um, let's talk about how because ultimately, right, we're, we're trying to talk about DAOs, uh, not exclusively, but you know, in general. And for artists, for creators, for makers of all sorts, uh, NFTs, of course, are the first step, uh, possible first step of uh, getting uh, their community involved and, and rewarded in, in every resell and, you know, in other ways, of contributing to the music, you know, generative art, et cetera. Um, as a DAO, as a community, what have you seen so far and what, would you like to see in terms of empowering the creators and their community um, in terms of what the creators themselves can do and what the blockchain and DAO community in general can do for them? Let's let's try to uh, focus on that. I mean, spend some time on that now to um, not figure out everything all at once, but to kind of use on it for a bit and see what comes up. You know, DAOs are very special. Um, you know, un unlike a traditional, let's say, nonprofit or B corporation, um, the structure of a DAO is very unique. Um, I know that in, I don't know if many of you are familiar with Hashlips. Um, if you use the art generator, you know him. Um, his community actually tasked, I got tasked <laughs> a job and we actually wrote a book. We wrote a book that was a community effort. And what's so unique about it is that everybody contributed to this story, but it wasn't about the novella. It was about the use case of blockchain technology to give attribution and contribution in a meaningful way. And what I meant by that is, let's say I have uh, an, a music NFT, right? and I had owned, you know, um, one from Bialetta, if folks know who Bialetta is, and I know I owned one from Josh Savage, and both of those gave me certain rights. So. When I took those NFTs, I embedded their songs into the metadata, but I also alluded to them in the storyline itself. You know, the characters were going to one of Violetta's concerts. Um, Josh Savage's love letter was, you know, a part of the main character's storyline. And what was so fascinating is that because it was embedded in the metadata itself, each iteration, so... Um, I co-authored it with a gentleman named Comfort, and um, he had never written a book before. So that was even more fun because we get to loan our credibility. We loan our reputations. Um, and it's a very profound thing when you're transferring your skills to somebody else and loaning them your platform, right? So he kind of had this outline, and then I filled it up and showed him how to write 80,000 words in a week, right? And then he decimated it. But each stage was minted. And um, as we added new characters, it was minted. So we had this collaborative fractional share ownership of a living, breathing novel that is on Amazon. Now, granted, it's out there in the public. You don't have to pay for it. You just pay for the printing or whatever, because it is an open source project. But what it did is it served as a roadmap for people who wanted to create meaningful community around a shared piece of work. And as an artist, if I'm creating a, a piece of work, it doesn't matter if it's a book, piece of art, um, a musical script, um, choreography, <laughs> dance, you know, whatever. Whatever it is that your thing that you're creating, the only reason why it's in existence in one way, shape, matter, or form is because the audience gives it life. You know, I can write many books, but until a reader adopts those characters and takes that ownership of that story, 
it's just, you know, a bunch of words on a piece of paper. There's a symbiotic relationship between the maker and the viewer or the, the consumer. I hate to use that word, but we do have this collaborative environment, you know, between the creator and the the receiver, you know, and it's a very fascinating way to think of things. Um, right now, you know, there's the dialogue around, let's say, friend tech. I am not proponent, just so you know. I don't, I think it's shady, but it's not going to go away because the concept, the underlying want is there. We want to have people, you know, in our communities um, be able to have a piece of the pie because inherently as humans, we kind of know that, right? It would be awesome for me if I'm in a space, if I could take a screenshot of all of the people in the audience and the money that I would receive for my performance as a speaker be shared because the audience is elevating my stature, right? It's it's loaning me their credibility as a speaker, you know? <laughs> no one on, a, on an empty stage, you know, I could be on a stage, but if it's an empty audience, you know, what's the point, right? So it's the same kind of concept is how are we going to create from here on out in a in a very meaningful way that would include other people, you know, our audience members, those that, that are there to help support us. <clears throat> so like with our novella, our novella was this use case, right? So now how do you take it to the next level? How do you create a DAO? Well, this is a physical representation of a DAO. So I can go to my editors or I can go to shareholders or I can go to, you know, VC people and say, do you see this book? This book actually has 500 authors. It's got 18 different musical artists. It's got the artistic artwork of, you know, 45 people in the community. And each piece of those, uh, those creative content is attached to some metadata of an actual piece on the blockchain. And so when this book is sold, those fractional shares can come back to the people who've contributed. You know, we never think about the person, I said this so many times, about the person sitting next to Leonardo da Vinci in the coffee shop. Who is the person that said, hey, can you bend light <laughs> to, you know, Isaac Newton? Um, these are the kinds of things that we don't think about, but if we were to able, or we were given a mechanism to pay it forward, you know, and pay back those folks that have helped us along our way. How much more robust would our ecosystem be, but also the the binds that, that tie us all together as humans, you know, to be able to go back and say to my mentors, you know, here's a, a timeline of my life and here are my teachers that have taught me these kinds of skills, you know, how would I be able to embed them in in that metadata in such a way to pay that back, pay them back for their time and their effort? Um, I think that's a really profound thing to think about. But we have to train each other to think in those terms, you know, because a lot of times, as an influencer or you know a person that is of of stature in, in our society, they're trained to think that it's all about them. <laughs> when essence, it's really not. So. You have to kind of change that that way of thinking, and it starts by saying, "Okay, what mechanisms are out there that I can pay it back, and I can, you know, start at this moment and create that ecosystem." So, thankfully, we have a DAO, and DAOs come into existence um, because we have the blockchain. The blockchain um, is irrefutable in that respect, and as long as we continue to use them that chain continues to strengthen. And so, um, you know, those are the kinds of mechanisms that we can put in place. You know, it's not um, a governmental per se <laughs> kind of structure, although some people do look at a DAO and say, well, this is socialist, <laughs> this is a compound. And I think to myself, you know, I have three children and my husband and I are eating Rama noodles currently so that they can have the resources to go to school, you know, the, the family unit redistributes in order to pay and to help those that are in the system, right? It's the same thing with the DAO, is that if you're contributing to the livelihood of that, that ecosystem, you should be able to have a mechanism in place that can give you those, those um, fractionalized kind of shares in the spoils, for lack of a better term. So 
I don't uh, know if that answered it. But... <laughs> I, I, I want to focus on the one thing that you said uh, specifically about, so you, you wrote this novel together, right? It's a collective thing, but let's say for 100 people. You mentioned about going to VCs, going to the publishers, which brings me to the question of why. Why even go to VCs? Why even go to the publishers? You already have, as a DAO, as a community, right? You already have the resources or can have the resources to bypass that system, right? So can you just uh, use that membership to maybe, you know, prepay for the next project or to... Uh... Well, I think I misspoke because it, the reason why you would present it it's basically the best analogy would be the four minute mile until someone actually broke the four minute mile. No one believed it could be done. Um, because I earned my livelihood in a legacy system, right? Um, there is a certain kind of clout that you get when you publish a book, right? That's not self published. For those of you that don't know, if you have your name in a, in a tear sheet, you are automatically given uh, the veneer of of a professional, <laughs> you know, whether you are or not, right? Um, to go to a venture capital um, or to go to, you know, corporations outside of this ecosystem, it's more using it as a tool to show them what's possible. But not only that, show them from here on out, you better change the way that you're doing business because the rest of the world is going to do it this way. And if you don't, you know, kind of bend <laughs> you, your way of doing things, then you are not going to be a part of that tribe. You know, I know that sounds kind of harsh, but, you know, let's use X as an example, right? Uh, recently, you got judged or demoted based on the people you were hanging around, your affiliations, your association. Um, advertisers had access to your information or your labels before you do. You don't know if you're shadow banned, but the advertisers do. Well, what happens if you flip the script and you say, I do not want to see this ad <laughs> and their social currency gets dinged in the process? What happens at that point? So me as somebody who has written for legacy publishers and have had that kind of opportunity, um, it's a very profound thing to go to the, the meeting with all of these folks that are used to being gatekeepers and saying, look, your time as a gatekeeper is over. <laughs> you know, these silos are being broken down by people who are taking ownership um, of their mobility. And I think it's, it's an interesting tool. I mean, all of these things are conversation tools, right? One way, shape, matter, or form. So I think I misspoke. Um, or didn't oh, no expand the way that I should have because the, there's no reason for you to go out, you know, to, yeah. to go. Do you yeah. feel that there's enough of uh, awareness in the maker and the great green general right now to say, hey, maybe we can go around the VCs, maybe we can go around Amazon, maybe we can use this DAO tool to be our own VCs, be our own publishers, be our own distribution, uh, just kind of create our own system, you know, not even break the four minute mile, but the redefine what it means to run a mile, you know, just run the different track or, or whatever, just say, why should I run it for four minutes? Maybe I want to run this slowly. And that's, that's how we're going to roll. And I'm probably hard for metaphor, but you get well, the idea. I think that there has to be one other facet to this equation and it's the maker mindset, right? Um, to be honest with you, it's a lot easier to blame somebody else for our lot in life, right? If if you're talking amongst friends and they're like, oh, well, yeah, I see that you wrote a script. I'm so sorry it wasn't accepted. And they're like, you know what, it was those damn gatekeepers, you know, <laughs> they're the ones that, that put me here. The minute that you erase those boundaries and those excuses, um, you have a weird moment where you're looking in the mirror and you're looking at yourself and you're thinking, did I do everything within my capabilities to make this a success? And it's a big burden <laughs> to shoulder. And thankfully, we don't have to shoulder it all of ourselves. You know, um, these ecosystems that we are able to build help us shoulder, you know, the brunt of the the sobriety, <laughs> the heft and the weight of self-ownership. And in it's interesting it, when you're building a community of around an authentic kind of way of living, um, 
it does give you the mechanical advantage in sense that, you know, the reason why this novella actually was kind of successful, you know, we, we hit, you know, within the top 500 of all downloads on Amazon, it was because you had 500 people participating in it. <laughs> you know, they all had a vested interest and they were all proud of it. And so that mechanical advantage, many hands make the work light is, is something that happens. And so, you know, it is one of those things, but I think people are understanding the writing on the wall. It doesn't matter where you go. I travel to numerous countries, you know, and you speak many languages, but deep down that mobility matters. It, it's in the heart of every person. They all want their freedom. They all want to not be, you know, um, under the, the thumb of somebody else. They don't want to have um, their, their fate dictated by somebody else, by an unseen hand. You know, each and every one of us wants to believe that we can change our stars. And we can when you realize that these tools that are at your fingertips will allow you to have the best education you've ever had, the most opportunities you've ever had, exposure to the most people that you've ever had, and the ability to change the lives of others in ways that you've never experienced before. And one of the things that I've told other people, you might not know where to start. <laughs> this is a big, big thing to think about. Makers, you know, are usually in their studio. <laughs> they don't think about how do I have to leverage the algorithms in order to get maximum exposure, blah, blah, blah. You know, by and large, they like to stay <laughs> as a hermit in their studios just playing with their, their tools and their medium, right? Um, this can be a lot for people to think about, but um, it is kind of an exciting time because, you know, we we get a little help from our friends. And thankfully, all of us here today, you can look to your left and your right. You have no idea who is whose PFP is next to you. You know, you don't know how they might be able to help you. And you might not know what it is that you're supposed to do, but I guarantee you, if you look to your left and right and you hear the stories of someone, you say, hey, I can help you. And you, you build somebody else up first. When you do that, you discover things about yourself. You discover passions that you might not have known that you had. You discover, um, you know, skills that you haven't used in a while. Um, you've discovered things that you learned as a child that are very useful now as an adult, you know, but you would have never discovered those things if you didn't help somebody else kind of unearth what it is that they needed to do. So it is kind of an interesting thing. And when you create that ecosystem and you put the pieces in place, because here's the other thing too, DAOs and that mechanism strip the emotion out of the transaction. And what I mean by that is when people start building together, um, incredibly intense bonds happen. <laughs> you know, you become quick friends. I don't know how many of you have thought about a space and you've instantly felt a connection with someone's voice. And I've seen it in class. You know, I used to teach you know, 20,000 people in a weekend, right? And you see somebody in your class and it clicks with them and their face glows because they understand it and automatically they think she's my new best friend. You know, I've had students show up at my house and thinking that I'm their new best friend because you've made these incredible connections right away. Um, but what happens is that humans are perfectly and wonderfully flawed. You know, we're going to make you angry. We are going to make you see plaid. We're going to incite just, uh, those visceral feelings, people are going to let you down. They're going to break your heart. They're going to betray you in ways that you've never imagined. They're going to make you cry, you know, but in the same breath, humans also laugh and they, they count your tears just as much. They'll love you unconditionally for no reason at all. <laughs> you know, those are the kinds of things that humans are unique and they do, but you don't want those in your contracts, <laughs> you know? And so having a DAO with these kind of sterile kind of smart contracts that do all of the heavy lifting in that respect means that you have good fences and good fences make good neighbors. So 
that's, yeah. that's a very smart thing. I, I can think of myself uh, back when I used to sketch comedy. And as, as a young writer, I thought all my decks were brilliant. And then uh, the actual leader of the group had to gatekeep and, and cut a lot of them, right? Even though I, I thought they were brilliant. And then once I became a team leader myself, I realized that it's not that simple. That everyone thinks their stuff is the best. But at the end of the day, there's a lot to consider. Um, and I wonder... Have you seen, or you know, just theoretically speaking of it? So, if we have a DAO, right? Let's say have different creators or specific creators. You have a community, and all those jobs of a publisher, PC, of legal, of whatever tech support, is needed, right? There's a lot of different roles that are not especially creative, that are not especially fun for creatives. Uh, and what do you do with that, right? So, for example, in the Dex protocol. You know, when we release that, uh, that's going to be, uh, there's going to be a huge role for experts, huge roles for uh, people to be delegated to, to be trusted with, you know, greater voting power in order to make those expert decisions to really kind of avoid meritocracy, um, while the rest of the members don't have to worry about things that they don't fully understand, while still, you know, getting rewarded for it, right? There's kind of an incentive to align with the experts and let them do their thing. Do you see... Uh, for creatives in general to, in their DAOs, to have this kind of um, openness, I guess, towards um, bringing in the experts and trusting the experts on uh, the publishing, tech, legal, again, all other sides, and in that way, maybe subverting the, the old school VC and publisher model by making those VCs, making those publishers, making those legal and other experts prove themselves to the DAO and be responsible to the DAO and then align incentives in a way that uh, when the experts make good expert decisions and move the DAOs to su for, you know, towards success for the actual creators, uh, then both the creators and those experts get rewarded and, and everyone is happy. It, it sounds a bit idealistic, but I truly believe it's possible. And I, I know I see the Dexy team working and I see others working on it. And I'm curious to hear your perspective on it as a, as a creator, as a maker. Well, you know what's really funny? Um, I'll use this example. Um, I was trained to be an extrovert, but I'm deep down an introvert. Right? <laughs> I love my privacy and I love my garden. And <laughs> I like being at home, you know, those kinds of things, right? I know what my skill sets are. I know where I'm weakest, right? And to be able to take advantage of what we're calling a mechanical advantage, um, having an ecosystem like like Dexy, Dexy gives you the tools that you don't have to be, have those proficiencies, for instance, you know, and it's important because the barrier to entry in general has lowered with the uh, advent of public AI. Now, the AI tools that we play around with here in our ecosystem are nothing compared to what <laughs> the powers that be have been playing with for, you know, decades, right? Um, you can take a, a chat GBT, <laughs> I know, right? Or a Claude, or you can take all of these large language models, llamas, whatever. Um, you can use those to kind of set your path, right? And do the legalese or the things that you really don't like doing. You know, I married an accountant, so I wouldn't have to do it. You know, <laughs> I mean, it, those are the kinds of things I can read code. I can code various languages too, but it's like stabbing my eyes out with a scissor. It's not something that brings me great joy, you know, unless I get to reprogram a robot and smash it into the wall or whatever with the kids. You know, those are the kinds of things that you think about. Um, in this day and age, it used to be that when you sat at a table, if you didn't speak the language of business, then they wouldn't take you seriously. That was one of the things that really bugged me when I saw at Maker Fair, so many incredibly gifted kids with incredible innovation and inventions, um, either A, you'd have really smart folks walk down the aisles and buy you out outright so that no one would ever see <laughs> what you just built <laughs> because it was a competitor or whatever, you know, or you would see them be passed by. And, um, what I started thinking about is how do we create a business plan that speaks the same language? So can you make a business plan, let's say, on one page where you understand, let's say, what's your, you know, I don't know, 
you, you just sit there and you think to yourself, okay, what's my value proposition? And instead of using those big, huge terms that you learn in the Ivy League schools, you could say, okay, here's what my superpower is and here's what I'm bringing to the table. You know, you change the narrative, you change the nomenclature so that you're all on the same page. That's what's happening now. Because the barriers to entry are lowered. You don't have to just speak English um, in order to have the language of business. And I put that in air quotes. You know, you have translators right there at your fingertips, right? That you have the ability to cross pollinate in ways that we've never been able to do before. And when you think of a, an ecosystem like Dexy, right? Um, me as a maker, I think to myself, I want to create an ecosystem around myself um, that builds up my community, that rewards the people that have invested in me, right? And I want to create that ecosystem um, without having to go to all of the, you know, the lawyers and, and everything else. Now you should, I'm telling you, you should, <laughs> right? You want to protect your business model um, because, you know, those are the things that make us, you know, above board. But um, to be able to have those outsourcing of those certain facets of your business plan, to be able to concentrate on other things, that's kind of what we're supposed to do. I mean, when you think about it, people make money where there are points of friction, right? Um, arbitrage happens where there are points of friction. Technology, by nature, removes friction. Innovation removes friction. So we're we're racing to that that bottom where there isn't as much friction right so you know you have to kind of think of it in those terms that when there is no friction when there is no problem to solve then you know how are you going to take advantage or use your skills in such a way to profit from them so it, it is kind of an interesting thought experiment and i think each of us are going to have to think about that why are you here why are you in spaces right now why are you on X platform or why are you on Instagram or why are you on TikTok? Is it because you want to be famous? Do you want 20 you know, seconds of fame or do you want 20 years of relevance? And I can guarantee you relevance comes in a different way. Um, relevance comes by making sure that it's not a flash in the pan, that you're putting those little nodes in place and connecting yourself to others in strategic ways that build up everybody and benefit those around you as well because the folks that just uh, crop share for lack of the better term their audiences strip mine their audiences um they're not going to get new ones you know because the social capital and the social currency your reputation um because of the data is going to follow you so you know you have to be very cognizant of the things and the choices that you make from here on out and so you know, DAOs are something you should be thinking about, especially if you want to benefit and profit from the things that you make. Do you think that with everything, especially DAOs being, you know, on-chain and, or a lot of the on-chain, but the reputation for sure being on-chain and public, and would that be, do you think it's going to be um, kind of self-enforcing in terms of people uh, working more towards the relevancy and, and the legacy rather than immediate profit and fame and all those things? Or do you think like people do what people always do? Well, history doesn't repeat itself. People do. And people are always going to be nefarious. We've already talked about the flawed humanity, right? <laughs> um, but I think about this, you know, we should be building vineyards that feed other people in the future, not necessarily ourselves. And I think this comes with the fact that, you know, I have three kids, my youngest just went off to college. And so your perspective changes at each stage in your life. Um, I'm at a stage in my life where I realize I'm not in an accumulation phase. I'm more in a, a editing phase. And what I mean by that is for those of you who've ever, I don't know, have ever carved a stamp or carved a piece of wood or whittled, you know, a chess piece out of a, a log or something. Um, it's the process of taking away that refines who you are, what you believe in, um, and that thing that you'll ultimately be. And so 
when I think about business now, um, when I was in my 20s, I was the youngest, you know, broker <laughs> in Morgan Stanley, you know, and I was the only female in the bullpen. So my perspective as a 20 something year old is completely different now that I'm, you know, hovering almost on 50. You know, you, you start thinking about the things that really mattered once upon a time. And in this day and age, our time horizons we can live longer than we've ever lived before. We can be immortals. You know, if you're a story worth retelling, you never die. You people just, you know, carry your story onward and continue to tell it. Um, but at the same time, everything has been compressed in terms of, you know, look at look around you. I mean, um, Twitter AI or uh, Twitter, crypto Twitter, I should say, or X, that X is going to kill me. Um, Things happen in 24 hour cycle that should have happened in like weeks, you know, in previous time, right? Um, in the Muppet movie, it says that when you're a child, the days go by year by year. You know, it's just slow. You just think about summer break and it lasts forever. But as an adult, your years go by day by day, you know, <laughs> it switches. It's the same kind of concept. So you have to ask yourself, why are you here? What are you building? What story do you want to tell? And how do you want, that story to be told after you're gone, because you don't get the luxury of just dying anymore. You don't get the luxury of just going into the six foot box and with all the rest of the chess pieces at the end of the game, right? Although we all do go into the box at the end of the day, the fact is, is that you may not die the way that you want to because data lives forever and the blockchain is going to live and outlive us. So you have to take ownership of what that message what that project, what your legacy is going to be in a, in a meaningful way. You don't want, you don't want somebody else to tell your story in, in the sense that living by proxy, you do want them to remember you. You want to be, you know, the story and the stars that everybody thinks is great, but um, it's your narrative. You get to be the main character. You get to be the hero. You get to be the villain if you want. But the fact of the matter is, is that you could, you call the shot. So that starts by saying, what tools do I have? How am I going to use them? And how am I going to take ownership of my own journey in that process? So if you're a music maker, you know, the world has the same eight notes on the, on the staff, right? And if you're an artist, the world has the same three primary colors, right? How you mix it belongs to you and how it's replayed um, is, you know, based on how you affect and, and touch the lives of others. Yeah, you know, it really amazed me. It was a few years back. I remember when exactly, but somebody kind of mapped the genome of music, right? Creating, uh, I don't know if it was AI or not AM, but whatever it was, he basically mapped in every possible combination of notes and and patterns ever to exist. And and shockingly, and I say this very much in quotation with it, you know, irony, um, people still create music. And it's so great, the amazing, beautiful original music that may sound similar to something else, maybe the derivative of something else, but we still love, we still find moving and in many ways, you know, when it comes to hits and things that really touch us personally, music that feels different, feels new, feels innovative, feels exciting, right? So I, I do believe that no matter or how much AI there is, and of course you can be noise from it now. And even though there's only so many notes and so many apartment colors, I think there's thankfully uh, no limits to human creativity, right? So I see from your <laughs> emotions that you agree. Uh, since we're running out of time, I really wanted to get this question in. Um, so for so I don't want to pump Dexy too much, but there is an option in, in the Dexy protocol, right, to uh, use for your governors both tokens and NFTs, so either or or both. And um, for me, as a, as a creative, someone who's been following NFTs for a while, you know, and participating in some interesting creative ones, um, I wonder if, from your perspective, what have you seen and what would you like to see in terms of creatives using NFTs that they issue or sell to their community for that community to vote with those NFTs in the DAO of, of that artist, of that creator, or a collective of creators, right? What kind of potential do you see in using artworks, music works, um, digital or fungible, actual physical uh, things, creations, um, 
backed by an NFT as a digital stamp of uniqueness uh, to use that for governance, to give that kind of governance power to people who actually bought or otherwise received uh, an actual piece of work from a creator. You know, this is a weird question. Um, it's an interesting one. Cause sorry, I'm not sorry. <laughs> no, one of um, the interesting use cases that I've kind of been noodling over myself is the creation of pigments. So I, you know, I make my own paint, right? Because I don't like to pollute the watershed. And even though cadmiums and cobalts are definitely gorgeous, um, and I'm a collector of all those pigments, right? Those are certain things that I use in my own artwork. And I think that the digital stamp, an NFT, um, that kind of follows the pathway of raw materials, um, a lot of people, a lot of artists themselves, makers, they don't know where their pigments come from. They don't know that children are in mines mining those cobalt, you know, 9, 10, 11 year old children, right? Um, and they don't think twice about it. You know, you go to the craft store or whatever, and you, you know, you've got a paintbrush, you've got these, these paints. I think that there's a unique opportunity um, to look at the things that we consume and that we use to build with, whether it's the the tools, um, it could be the cloth or the fabric in your apron <laughs> that you wear. Um, it can be any number of things. For me, it happens to be pigments because that's where my passion is, right? And I love it. Um, but I think that when it comes to what I hope for and what I wish I could see is that we as consumers are more cognizant and mindful about the origin you know, we don't know what the original sources sometimes come from, especially in a digital age, right? Um, we don't know how to follow that pathway when it comes to AI. We don't know what it was trained on, right? It's all this mismatch. But I do know what the cotton field, that the cotton that I'm using or the hemp that I'm using on my canvases comes from. And to be able to offer that um, in an irrefutable way to my my consumers, my base, my my investors, my patrons. And I can say, you know, when you're buying my artwork and you get this original piece, um, it comes with this notary that says where all the materials come from. You know, it was ethically sourced. Let's say it's an ethically sourced pigment, you know. Her name was Maria. She grew this indigo. Her mother gave her the recipe to make this indigo in a certain way. She wove this fabric with, you know, a, a skill set, uh, a pattern that was handed down to be able to capture those stories, the stories of the makers, the story of their craft, you know, is something that I don't think we've ever touched on. And I wish that we do because these makers are dying daily and they're taking their skills, their wisdom to the grave with them. And as we become more digital in general, um, we're going to lose track of the people, the haberdashers, the people who make their hats. We're going to lose the barrel makers. We're going to lose those folks that know how to make hops or, you know, a mead or, you know, how to transform these, these certain raw materials into something amazing. We're losing that knowledge and we have a, a unique opportunity to capture it and if you had a DAO mechanism, can you just imagine being able to say, you know, with the profits in this DAO, we can give back for the seed, for the uh, land, for the resources needed to grow more indigo. You know what I mean? It, those are the kinds of things that you think about. And we assume give back to other people, but it's give back to the ecosystem so that it can replenish itself too. I mean, honestly, why stop there? I would go further. I, um, I would, if I were creating DAO, and I would actually love for you to create DAO or multiple DAOs on the Dex platform. And I'm sure a lot of other contributors to Dex would as well. Uh, it's super see those things, but just, you know, speaking of myself and brainstorming this, I would love to see creative DAOs where uh, those makers of those materials are part of the DAO, have a stake in the DAO. Uh, and they, I, I don't like, personally, I don't like the idea of uh, any sort of organization paying 
uh, those creators, uh, those original makers of those materials, uh, post factum as a sort of, you know, some sort of a bottom line item, uh, but rather for those creators to have a stake originally, not and getting paid automatically, right? Because blockchain does allow for that, but also having a stake in the decisions of the DAO and in the story of the DAO, right? We, today we talked a lot about narratives and stories, and I think it's super powerful, especially in this case. I think it's the most poignant and powerful case, um, you know, the creator case of including every part of the process in in the artwork, whatever it is, in, in the creation, whatever it is. And there's a really, I'm going to get a flag for this, but let's say book that did not impress me that much as, as how it was written, um, but an interesting case about a chicken farm in China that's on the blockchain and how they use blockchain to track these chickens from the farm to, to the table, right, for, for hippies in China or elsewhere, I don't know. Um, that's an interesting use case, right, but that's a very... I would say primitive and kind of base use case. And I think we could definitely apply that to, to art, to materials for our everyday living, you know, for the pants we buy, the cars we buy, the houses we built, whatever. Um, so I would really like to see that and I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts about it. See those people included and opted into the system so they know what their building is for, what they're doing this for and why they're benefiting from this. And to be very conscious about um, the materials chosen and work created. I think, I can't, I can't remember which popular NFT collection, whether it was for apes or CryptoPunks or something else. Um, Dominic Domino Shader and one of those big collections, I think paid like $50 on Fiverr for their art or something, right? And then that's it. Like I want to see the opposite. I want to see everyone in the process being create, being, um, you know, part of it. Anyway, I'll shut up now. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, no. I think that you're hitting it, the nail on the head. There was a project called Nemeth um, that was in the art ecosystem about a year ago. And their their light papers are worth a read to anybody who, who likes what we're talking about right at this moment. But basically what they did is they were saving portions of the rainforest. But your NFT actually was a guardian over a GPS location where they gave the ownership of these NFTs to the tribes, to the, to the indigenous people. And the way that it was done was so awesome. And, you know, it's not just saying we're going to come in here, you know, as a white knight on a horse and we're going to save you. You know, no, it, it, what they did is they, they had this ecosystem where you had a collaboration um, and they used the blockchain specifically in a very interesting use case. And I think that we have yet to scratch the surface. I agree with you 100%. You know, it shouldn't be an afterthought that you're going to throw some crumbs back to the people that did all that. You should start from the very beginning, the moment that they're planting the seeds in the garden and you're you're actually taking those QR codes on the seed because you can actually do that. We have the technology to do that, that we can say, this is the lineage of the seed this is where it came from. These are the people that have pollinated and cultivated this line of grapes or this line of whatever. And you can follow that trail. And each step of the the path is is marked, you know, just like that novella, right? Each iteration is minted and each iteration has all of its multi-pronged approach to it so that they are all involved in that collaboration from tip to toe. And if we as a consumer base, or even just as creative, from here on out, I can't look at anything in my studio without seeing where it started from its inception and the, the fingerprints of the people who touched it. Um, and to be able to, I don't know, preserve those fingerprints. It's like, I know this sounds silly to the folks in the audience, but you know, when my kids were little and they took their first steps, they would either lick the window or they would keep their handprints on the window. And that three foot mark across the back window, I never wanted to wash because <laughs> you look at it, their fingerprints and it's the mark of 
a, a milestone, right? It's the same kind of concept here is that we want to be able to um, preserve in meaningful ways for posterity the journey. And um, it matters to all of us because we play a role in that story too. Absolutely. Uh, we're burning a bit over. So uh, as I wrap up, well, a couple of things. First of all, uh, for those of us, uh, those in the audience who uh, are participating in our ZLE and Link3 and whatever quest we're running, uh, there is a keyword I've been told, and the keyword is creative. So the keyword is creative. Uh, that's for you following. Uh, and in general, um, I want to keep talking about this, but I want to respect everyone's time. Uh, okay, last question I always ask, um, and this is more of a proposition, I guess, than a question, but uh, Sarah, anyone you want to give a shout out to, uh, find them or you can send them to your question as well. And uh, on behalf of Dexel, I'll follow them, just cool people, all the cool projects, cool communities that you think we definitely should follow and people should definitely hear about. Um, this is how I think communities grow. This is how they cross pollinate. This is how people discover, discover cool stuff. And um, this is, I think, all about discovering cool stuff and figuring things out together. I could say so many people <laughs> and I'm going to get yelled at. It's like a mom being asked who their favorite child is. Each one of my kids thinks that they're their favorite or my favorite, and I'm not going to refute that. But I will say this. Um, thank you. Thank you for the privilege of being on your platform. And I will marinate and think about someone's life that you can change and the stars that you can change for them. Um, I want to be mindful of the choice. But I do want to say thank you for each and every person, your presence today. I saw Carrie was here earlier. She ducked out. She is somebody that I think everybody should follow. Um, I see um, Funda up at top and some of my friends, you know, that I see around in the ecosystem. Each and every one of you are using your superpowers for good simply by showing up. You know, your presence um, uplifts all of us. And to each and every person listening in on the recording, thank you for your time. It's the most precious thing that you have. And the fact that you would use such a scarce resource um, to listen to the voices of strangers is a gift. It's a gift to us. And I just hope that we sparked <laughs> some kind of, you know, joy in each one of you, but inspiring you to go and build and do because we need more. We need more innovation. We need more use cases that push the envelope. We need more DAOs. We need more creative DAOs. Um, those kind of sanctuaries and safe havens for the creative where we can uplift one another and, you know, cross pollinate, build the kinds of things that we want to build and see in the world. So um, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, I'd be happy to help you. Um, if you're raising, mentoring, just are awesome to young makers, um, I'd love to help you. That would be another great use case for DAOs in general is the hack schoolers, those random and wonderful, unexpected joys that they are. Um, and just thank you. Thank you once again for everything. Today was just very special for me. And um, just being able to sit and chit chat, uh, it, it makes me smile ear to ear. You know, it, it really does warm me at my heart because there's so much anxiety and yelling and screaming and back and forth in the space um, to have these these moments where we can, you know, just think about how we want to build the world and make it a better place. Um, that's the good stuff. That's the stuff that matters. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really hope there's going to be somehow fewer moments of screaming and anxiety and more moments like these. I'm smiling as well. And and I'm I'm looking forward to more smiling moments. I think we can at least try to create them. And everyone follow Sarah, send her a message. Um, I'm be super respectful of her time, but definitely collab. You know, maybe from strangers, all of us are going to be here, friends in some DAO. Maybe Sarah DAO. We'll see. Um, time will tell. But for sure, go create DAOs. Go create your your work, your art, or whatever you may think. And I think it's really powerful to me. And it really, of everything we spoke today, it really rang out to me about how cobalt is, it is um, 
retrieved and, and, and mined and, and how this could be done sustainably and everything can be done sustainably with single story or like unique stories of each creator kind of being into woman. So I would love for artists to be mindful of that and to create those stories together and to use DAOs to make uh, both the economic incentives and the stories and uh, the recognition, the public recognition of everyone in the process, right from the extraction of materials to the selling of whatever art is to the owning of whatever art is created. Uh, I'm really hoping that DAOs can serve that and will serve that. I, be I believe they can. I've seen that they can. And whoever's listening to this and, and will do those kind of DAOs, send Dexy a shout out and definitely um, anything that Sarah's doing, got to follow and, and see and hopefully we'll do some really cool stuff together, <laughs> you know. Um, all right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sarah. I'm going to end this for now. We're back again next week with another awesome guest. But this has been personally a very, a very beautiful experience. So I'm just going to bask in it for a while. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Go on to greatness, you all. Go on to greatness. And I'm tackle hugging you through the phone. <laughs> Ditto. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye, sir.